I love my family. I have a great family. Uh, my wife, Angie, is uh, incredibly smart. She is incredibly wise, um, incredibly beautiful. Um, she's incredibly patient, especially with me. Um, and she's an amazing woman. And then I have two kids, Gavin and Kiana, and they are talented. They are people of character. Um, they're hilarious. They got great senses of humor. And then there's me. And according to Hannibal a couple weeks, what I bring the, to the table is my good looks. So I have good looks and hopefully there's something else that I bring to the table. But that's, that's our family makeup. And one of the things that happens in our family is uh, there is a sense of uh, tremendous competition. We are a competitive family. Um, we're a family that likes to tell stories and share information. And so as a family, we have these times where we'll be sitting around talking and somebody will start a story or start sharing some facts and you can see it happening. The wheels are turning in somebody else's mind and they start going, you know, that story didn't actually go that way. That's not accurate. Or they'll start going, no, no, the facts are different. And so what will happen is often we will have a sarcastic comment will come and we'll start having a debate on who is right and what, what facts are right. And as I'm telling you this, I know my family's completely messed up but we're getting help. And as we have this conversation, one of the things that takes place is that we realize that we have this desire within us to be right. And to be the person that's sitting at the table that knows it all. And guess what? I don't think my family is any different from you. We are a people that love to know it all. We love to, to walk into a room and to be the smartest one in the room and to, to go, I have the knowledge on this and, and, and share that. And what I'm here to do this morning is to break that all apart. You know nothing. I know nothing. See, the reason I say that is because we worship a God this morning who has unending knowledge. He is a God that knows so much and it goes so deep that we can't actually fathom it. We're actually gonna look this morning at a God who knows it all. And so I wanna give you a principle this morning so that as we leave here, we can kind of remember this and understand this as we move into the seasons of life that we're all going through. And simply this, God's knowledge has no beginning and no end, but he brings with it his presence. God's knowledge has no beginning, no end, but with it, he brings his presence. So that's what we're going to start. That's the foundation of what we're looking at. And we're going to go about it by looking at three different areas. First, we're going to look at that God knows it all. And then we're going to look at that God knows you. And we'll end with God knows your remedy. So I want to prep you that we're going to jump around a little bit this morning. So I want you to be able to flip your Bible scroll your Bible, whatever you need to do to turn pages, but we're gonna be turning some pages this morning as we look at this God who knows it all. We're gonna start in the Old Testament book of Job. So I wanna invite you to turn in your copy of the scriptures to Job 38. Now, I wanna give you some context before we read. Uh, the book of Job, if you've never read it before, is about this, this guy named Job who was extremely blessed and had everything. Had a lot of finances and material possessions, a large family. Uh, life was beautiful. And then all of a sudden, there's this debate that goes on between God and Satan and that uh, Job will end his faithful righteousness to God if everything is taken from him. 
And so Job's life goes into utter chaos. Family members are dying. His possessions are being taken away. Basically, his legacy is being wiped out. And and as he's going through this, he's asking question after question on why is this happening? Why is this taking place? Who is God? Why would God allow this to happen? And it's all these questions. And now what you have to understand is the book of Job is like 42 chapters. All this happens and we get to chapter 38 and it's the first time in the entire book that God speaks. And so God comes in the midst of this storm to talk to Job, who is kind of in the pit. He is just, he's mourning and he's, he's dealing with it. And we get to these verses. Job 38, verse one. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm and he said, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set, or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. Then go to verse 31. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Now jump to chapter 39, starting in verse one. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time they give birth? They crouch down and bring forth their young. Their labor pains are ended. Their young thrive and grow strong in the wilds. They leave and do not return. Now, we're going to stop there, but this is an incredible piece of scripture. And when we look at this, what ends up happening is that we move into what we have to understand, that God knows it all. He knows everything and he knows it all. And you might be going, okay, but why are we starting there? Well, it's because through this text, I think what we find is really whenever we say God knows it all, there has to be a term for that. And maybe you know this term, maybe you don't. And so you're gonna learn something new this morning, but there is a term that's called omniscience. God has these omni aspects of him. And this is one of them, omniscience. And it means this, God is the ultimate criterion of truth, of truth and falsity so that his ideas are always true. So what this means is that God knows the truth. He knows the false of everything, everywhere, past, present, future, things that have happened, things that haven't happened. He knows it all. He is omniscient. So then we read in Job and we see how his omniscience comes about. Now, starting in Job 38, verse 2, God starts asking questions. And we didn't even read all the chapters, those two chapters. But what God does is he ends up asking Job 70 questions. So the God of the universe, the the creator God comes to Job and starts asking 70 questions. And Job is sitting there as he's asking it, kind of like, well, I, I, I... He doesn't know what to say. And the questions come. Uh, It got me thinking, it's kind of like this. Uh, um, How many of you have ever been pulled over? Holy cow, we have a lot of bad drivers in here. Okay, this is the second time I've done that. I did not expect anyone to raise their hand, okay? So thank you for being truthful. Um, So whenever you get pulled over, 
Uh, if you're a police officer, I am not, I totally respect you, okay? Except for this one moment right now. So here's the deal. I have been pulled over, and when I've been pulled over, the police officers will ask one of two questions. And so they'll come to the window and they'll come up to me and they'll say, do you know why I pulled you over? Or they'll ask, do you know how fast you were going? Now, those are unfair questions. They're unfair because they're asking questions revealing that they already know the answer. And for some reason, they want me to say it. And to both questions, I have to say, I have no idea. That's exactly what's happening in Job 38 and 39. God's asking questions, and he's asking them in a way where he already knows the answer. And Job doesn't know what to do. But through the questions and through uh, what is happening, what we find is that we learn about God's omniscience by the questions that he asks. So here, I'm gonna share some thoughts with you on what we learn about this incredible attribute of God from the book of Job. The first one is this. His knowledge set the foundation for thought and speech. His knowledge, God's knowledge, set the foundation for thought and speech. How do I know that? Well, look at verses, uh, verses one and two. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Now, he's saying this, and whenever we look at this, the first thing he's focusing on is his plans. So when you're making plans, what do you often do whenever you're making plans? You rely on the things that you have learned or the information that you have gained in order to make a good plan. But here's what you have to understand. God has never learned. He's never learned. See, God has never had to like think uh, of studying something so that he can understand it better to make his plans. God has never had to learn as the creator of all things. And so because of that, what we have to understand is that he is knowledge. He is knowledge. Nothing surprises him because he is knowledge. But on top of that, look at what he says. He tells Job that he is speaking words, but he doesn't have the knowledge. That is exactly who we are as humans. We talk a lot. And sometimes we continue talking without having the knowledge of what we are talking about. And yet, what we find out about God is that God has created plans and he's saying, Job, I have plans. You're speaking with no knowledge to even be talking about it because my knowledge, I have set the foundation for thought and speech. He created it. And as the creator, he has the knowledge about it. The second thing he does is that his knowledge set the foundations of the earth. Look at Job 38, starting in verse four. I mean, the first question is this, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Obviously, God knows the answer to that question. And he's asking it and he's saying, look, I've created the world. I've done all this. If you were to jump back to Genesis 1 and 2, here's the miraculous thing that you see is that God is hovering and what he does is he speaks and things are created. He says water, water's there. What's incredible about that is as he speaks it, he puts all the molecules together that he needed to put together to create water because his knowledge and his speech just goes forth and he does it. So he sets the foundation and he creates everything from word. I don't know if you've seen this, but have you ever seen the Palm Islands in Dubai? 
They're fascinating. The Palm Islands in Dubai are basically three man-made islands that are uh, really incredible feats of engineers. What they ended up doing, though, is that they built these using, get this, three billion cubic feet of sand that they uh, dr drug up from the seafloor. Three billion. Then on top of that, They took 7 million tons of mountain rock and laid it on top, and they built these islands. And people live on them, there's streets, uh, there's shops. And when you look from space, what you see is these islands that look like palm tree branches. Now, when you look at it, you're going, that's absolutely incredible that man did that. But man didn't create anything. Notice what man had to do they had to get seven billion, seven trillion items that God already spoke into existence to create something that made them feel like they were very proud and prideful and they built these and look at how great it is. And yet they've only used the things that God already put in place. It reminds me of the Tower of Babel like these proudful uh, creations that they build this up and look at what we've done. I shared this story in the first service and an engineer came up and talked to me afterward. And he said, they're absolutely incredible, but you know what we're finding out now? That they're actually falling in on themselves. And in years, they will be underwater. Then he said to me, he goes, I think Jesus taught about this what happens when you build your house on the sand? <laughs> See, when we think that we are so mighty and so great and we have all this knowledge, the reality is, is you have never spoken anything into existence. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to get us to understand really where we sit compared to a God who is full of knowledge. So he designed the foundations of the earth, but he also did something else. And Job tells us this, that his knowledge has control over nature. Look at chapter 39. Look at what it says. It says, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Now, for some of us, we might go, well, yeah, I've, you know, I've watched the incredible nature shows on television, so I've seen that. And what we have to understand is that whenever God asks this question, he's asking, do you know what's happening in the darkness, in the places where there's no cameras, nothing is happening in this moment? Do you know where the goat is giving birth? He's got control over nature and you and I don't. See, his knowledge has this control. And so he ends up saying you know, that he basically, he governs the elements, the animals, the atoms, the gases, the vapors with precision and authority. And you and I have a hard time showing up to places on time. Like this is who God is. His knowledge is so big that he has control over all of nature. Now, throughout the scriptures, the scriptures continually take us back to that God is omniscient. And we find that in a text in 1 Samuel 2. There's this woman, Hannah, she's praying this prayer. And this is one of her sentences that she says, talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth for the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. See, we must be a people who understand that God is a God of knowledge and we will never fully understand the knowledge that he has. And because of that, we should be in awe of him. When we worship, we should be sitting there going, man, this God's so big that I'm never going to come to the end of him. And what he knows, he deserves the glory. 
Um, this is where uh, Gavin Ortland ends up saying this, God fully knows himself and that his infinite knowledge encompasses his infinite being. God fully knows his own decree or eternal purpose and all the events that transpire as the outworking of this sovereign will. He knows everything. You know, I, uh, we just went on a family trip and there were times that we made plans and those plans didn't go completely the way that we expected them to go. And I had no knowledge of it. But God does. God has knowledge of everything, everything that goes on. And so Job wants us to see that God's knowledge has no beginning or end, but he brings with it his presence. So we know that just from these, these few verses that we read, we can see that God knows it all and there's a lot that we didn't even get to. But we have to then say, well, if God knows it all, does God know me? And I, I wanna tell you that God knows you. See, this attribute is incredibly important because in, in Matthew 6, verse 26, Jesus says this. He says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them, are you not much more valuable than they? See, God knows what's happening in nature, but he's also a God that gets extremely personal, and he knows you. He knows you. See, we have to understand that when we get to heaven, if there's uh, game shows, and I don't know that there will be, but if there are game shows, God's knowledge has so much that he will be the Jeopardy champ for all time. We will never get to that. His knowledge is immense. And because of all those things that are in his mind, what we also have to understand is it doesn't matter that he has all of those facts unless he also has something else called wisdom. See, sometimes we say knowledge and wisdom is the same, but they're actually different. See, knowledge is possessing facts and information. And if we had a God that we worship, that we just go, we're so glad that you have all these facts, that, that would be a boring God and not a God that deserves glory. But because he has all those facts and he has wisdom, what we have to understand is that wisdom is the ability to achieve the best for everyone with those facts. And because he has all that knowledge, he puts in his wisdom and we see that we have a God who knows everything. And because he knows everything and he has incredible truthful wisdom, he wants to become a personal God. He wants to know you. And so we find this play out in another chapter of the Bible. And I want you to turn to Psalm 139. And maybe you've uh, read this uh, over and over again, or you've seen it on like a piece of artwork, but these are incredible words to describe an om omniscient God. In Psalm 139, starting in verse one, it says this, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. See, this psalm is emphasizing God's intimate knowledge, and that when it's applied with this wisdom, that there's this relationship with humanity that he desires. What we find is that these verses actually confess two of the omnis of God, his omnipresence and his omniscience, that he is coming and he is present and he's bringing that knowledge into your presence. So how do I know that? Well, let's look at this. In verse one, the psalmist ends up revealing this, saying, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. That means that God knows the person. He knows you. 
He knows you actually deeply. Now, what, what's interesting is that the psalmist writes in a way that is actually written for us and not necessarily written for God. Because here's what we have to understand. When he says that God has searched him, it doesn't mean that God was searching the psalmist and searching out and finding new things about him. What it actually means is that it's saying that God knows us so deeply. He knows every little hidden area of our life, every little thing that we don't even know about ourselves, he knows. And it's so intimate that he has become this God that, that comes in with this knowledge to know who you are. See, when we look at the scriptures and we trace it through and we start looking at omniscience in every aspect, one of the things we understand is that God is not just a God about abstract truth. What he is, is he's a God that has this knowledge and because he pairs it with godly wisdom, what ends up happening is that he ends up being the source of assurance, confidence, joy, and motivation to his people. So this morning, if you're sitting here and you're questioning God because you're going through something that has been extremely hard, what you have to understand is that God knows everything. He knew before that happened. He knows what's going on right now and he knows what's gonna take place in the future. And because of that, we should be cuddling up to him and saying, I need you to hold me in the midst of this pain. because he knows the person. See, I need to tell you, you think you know yourself, but you don't know yourself as well as God knows you. Here's the second thing. We see it in verses two through three, we see that God knows our actions and our thoughts. Notice what says, you know, when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You know, when I read those verses, uh, uh, at first, there's like this fear that comes over me. Because I got to tell you, there are things that I uh, look at and I go, man, God, why did I say that? Why did I think that? Why did that go through my mind? And he knew it. He knew it was there, even though I didn't voice it to anybody else. But his knowledge includes every action, thought, and word. And he has concern for us in that. He is present. See, no matter how far away you feel like God is, the reality of it when we read scripture is that he is close and he knows the smallest details. Did you know, like, just sitting down is not really that great of a thing. But the psalmist writes about it. You know when I sit. Meaning that in this exact moment, God knew the seat that you were going to sit in today. That you would be sitting here and he actually cares about it. He knows the thought that is going through your mind right now. So if it's thinking about whatever you're going to eat for lunch, get it out of your mind because he knows what's happening and he wants you to think about him. See, that's the God that we're worshiping. So when the band's up here and leading us in worship, and sometimes we sit here and we kind of mumble the words and we sing them out, Is that showing a God who knows everything, knows every thought, knows every action? Is that giving him his due? But the psalmist goes on. And in verse five, he says that God knows our circumstances. See, some of you need to hear this again. He says, you hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. See, some of you, I don't know what it is, have entered here this morning and you got up this morning going, I have no idea why I'm going to church. 
I'm mad because the pain I'm feeling right now, because of the circumstance I'm going through right now is really painful. And I think God has forgotten about me. And yet you've walked in here and you need to see that, that verse five is saying that God is this personal God who says that I want to comfort you. And so the psalmist writes that he comes in and it's like he's tucking him in bed and he's being gentle and he's saying, I'm hemming you in. My protection is coming around you. I know the circumstance you're going through and I am and present. We might be saying, well, why did God let it happen? And yet it could be that God is allowing that painful circumstance to come in so that we get a better glimpse of how great and beautiful he is. And before you go, well, that's easy for a pastor to say, I want you to know that I have said numerous times, why God? I didn't ask for this, God. And there's times that I felt like he has forgotten me. And then I read that and I'm reminded that he has gone before. He's hemmed me in. His hand is on me. And none of it surprises him. See, looking at these aspects in Psalm 139, when we say, well, why is God's knowledge of it all so important? It's because he brings his presence with his knowledge. His presence changes everything in our lives. See, the, this is so meaningful and deep that the psalmist in verse six ends up saying, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Such knowledge is too lofty for me to attain. See, you are never going to be the smartest one in the room because God is present. And he says, I'm here. This knowledge should have a massive impact on us. It should impact uh, how we worship and adore. It should impact our humility. His knowledge of our hearts should influence the way that we pursue holiness. Understanding that he is an omniscient God should take us to deep places of understanding that he is with us, for us, and will walk through every circumstance with us. And that's why it leads to the third point, that God knows your remedy. Because you need one. See, God knows the remedy that you and I need. He must pair his knowledge with his wisdom in order to be a loving God. And so God's knowledge is so deep and, and his wisdom is so beautiful that it leads to the cross of Jesus. That's what his knowledge has done. It leads to the cross of Jesus where the wisdom that works off the knowledge of God, that basically what happens is that he knows that we need redemption. He knows the darkness of your heart, the sin that's grabbing a hold of you and pulling you apart. He knows the need that you have and that the need is found at the cross. And that's the knowledge that we need to gain, that the cross has changed everything. I, uh, I have said to myself numerous times that uh, if I'm gonna use a quote from someone, uh, it needs to be one or two sentences. And today I'm completely breaking it. So I'm gonna put it up on the screen because it's a huge quote. But this is from um, a scholar, Stephen uh, Sharnock. And this is what he says about the remedy. If he knows our sins, which are black, he knows every might of Christ's righteousness, which is pure, and the utmost extent of his merits, as well as the demerit of our iniquities. As he knows the filth of our sin, he also knows the covering of a savior. 
He knows the value of the Redeemer's sufferings and exactly understands every plea in the intercession of our advocate. Though God knows our sins with an informed eye, he does not see them with a judicial eye. His omniscience stirs not up his justice to revenge, but his mercy to pity. His infinite understanding of what Christ has done directs him to disarm his justice and sound an alarm to his bowels as he understands better than we what we have committed. So he understands better than we what our Savior has merited and his eye directs his hand in blotting out guilt and applying the remedy. That's this God of knowledge. So it makes me think back then. Do you remember the name of the two trees in the Garden of Eden? One was the tree of life. And the one that Adam and Eve were not to eat from was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. See, since Genesis 3, when they chose to eat and try to gain exhaustive knowledge, humanity has needed a remedy. Humanity has needed a, a cure. And we are finite beings who cannot be omniscient and we need an omniscient God to come with his knowledge who says, I know what you need and I am going to provide the remedy for you. And that remedy is my son who's gonna come and who through grace and mercy, he's gonna go to a cross and he's gonna pay the penalty of your sin and my sin. See, his knowledge meant that his love was so big for us that he was willing to send his only son to do this. Your knowledge can't save you, but the knowledge of your God can. See, God's knowledge has no beginning or end. But he brings with it his saving presence. Do you know that? Have you experienced that? Do you understand there's no other way to be in unity with God, the omniscient God, unless you understand the need for the remedy that's at the cross? Let's pray.